Welcome to Stories from the Center of the Universe, the podcast about the human experience. Mark Jenkins, welcome back to the Center of the Universe. It's good to be back. Uh, I, I have to tell you, I was uh, working on a prospect for the podcast. Uh, guy's name is Ron Lazaretti from Chicago. He said, Paul, I checked out a handful of your uh, episodes, but the one that really uh, was of interest to me was Mark Jenkins. <laughs> and uh, it's both about the first hour, your story, and about the second hour, your understanding of and your relationships with um, the government and the people of Israel. Uh, and so I, it was great to hear that. Actually, I heard it yesterday. And I'm like, oh, this, that's fantastic. I'll get to tell Mark that tomorrow. So you're, you're back, and we're going to talk about what's been going on uh, in Israel generally, and obviously the Hamas-Israeli conflict. And I, and I was reminded when I was doing a very light research this morning, this is the first time since 1973, so 50 years since Israel has declared a state of war. That's significant given how many skirmishes and week and a half long conflicts they've had. They, they've declared war, which I think means they intend to get to a set of objectives regardless of what it takes. Absolutely. Uh, uh, they, they tended to categorize uh, previous uh, conflicts as operations. So you had Operation Protective Edge, which is also, you know, in the Gaza. You had Operation Cast Lead, Operation, uh, I was thinking, Pillar of Strength. I mean, there have been a number of operations, uh, really since 2005, that pertain specifically to the Gaza. But, um, you know, the, the you had the first and second Lebanon War, uh, so to where Israel, I think for about 20 years, occupied uh, part of southern Lebanon to try to uh, keep uh, Hezbollah tamped down there. So, you know, to protect the uh, their their um, communities in the north. Um, but, yeah, it was very interesting, the word war being used, as I think I shared with you, uh, being in um uh, in a conference call with the ambassador, uh, Michael Herzog, uh, immediately after the October 7 incident. And uh, he, he was really underlining the word war. This is war. This is war. Making sure that we understand this is not an operation. This is not like anything that we have done. Um, and they tended to categorize it more as really since the War of Independence. I mean, since it going all the way back to the beginning of the country. Hmm. So you're right. I mean, the, they have very specific objectives. Um, this is not going to be, you know, to try to tamp this thing down a little bit and then, you know, everybody backs off. And in fact, that's really been the, the controversy, uh, if you will, or the war. There's, there's, there's a, this is a multi-level war. You have the, you have the, the, the kinetic battle that's taking place, you know, on, on in, in Gaza and uh, in the territories and in the, and in the north. But you also have this, uh, um, Sort of a battle internally, and in, in, in terms of uh, uh, not so much divided. The, the Israeli people are not divided, but you you have to keep it all together. You have to keep keep your people together, so you have a you're dealing essentially with refugees. So you've got that's also part of the struggle. How we're going to keep everybody together, keep our keep our country intact, our economy intact. Uh, but the uh, the bigger war that everybody's really engaged in right now is this this sort of war of public opinion, yeah. which they knew was going to come. And uh, you know, to your point about this being a war versus a, a military operation, the reality of it is that um, it, it's it's a uh, they're they're not backing off on this one. Mm -hmm. In other words, there's the, their objective is the the complete uh, annihilation of Hamas. They they see that as an existential threat. They can't let they can't leave a so much as a, a root or a vine of that anywhere. They they really want to uh, to go in, and they seem to be uh, resolved in that. Any uh, anybody that has aided them in non kinetic ways as well, so financially, politically. Uh, maybe even diplomatically, that they're included when you say uh, a root or a branch? Uh, now, that's interesting uh, because I think that there's a lot that we could do here that we're not doing um, in the United States. I mean, I think the, you know, you've heard a lot of rhetoric in Washington. I heard it. I was in Washington at the big gathering uh, uh, this past week uh, where we had almost 300,000 Jews. Wow. It was the largest gathering of, of Jews in American history, came together there in the mall in Washington, D.C. 
And, uh, you know, we heard from politicians and we heard the, the, we heard the rhetoric, you know, we're, we're there with, with Israel there, you know, you're, our, you're our, our best friend, our, our, our strongest ally. And, and there is truth in that. I'm not saying there isn't, but I think from, um, from the, from a government perspective, and I think specifically this administration, there's a lot more that we could do, uh, than we are doing. I mean, I'm very happy that we've sent at least, uh, two battle groups in, um, and and I am we are seeing now that you know there there are strikes that the U.S. is carrying out, um, but it is a uh, or 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 we've interdicted um, some weapons weaponry fired into from Yemen into Israel. But um, I, I think there's a lot more that we can do on the uh, on the world stage on the diplomatic front, and, I, and and but not just a diplomatic front, but also uh, there's a lot that we can do economically. But that that unfortunately. I think this administration that we're seeing in Washington is probably in crisis at the moment because they have to respond to the Jewish community here. They have to respond to Israel and uh, they're having to probably break the patterns that they are comfortable with that they would like to do, you know, um, this sort of policy of appeasement and cooperation and see if we can work something that way. Um where the the real lesson of the Middle East is the strong man who wins. It's the strong man. And that's what, you know, Ronald Reagan used to fam- famously said, peace through strength. But that's essentially what you have in the Middle East. The strong man at the end of the day is the one that's going to win. And Israel realizes that. And they've said that. If you listen very carefully to their rhetoric, they're saying it is through strength. Um, I'm in a briefing um, four days a week with uh, um, IDF general who, uh, yeah, that's his, whole, that's his whole position. We have to be strong in this. We're, we're not going to win if we moderate, if we step back, or if we're weak. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, yeah, I, the, the current administration um, is in a tough spot. Jewish Americans tend to vote for Democrats. Very much so. Uh, <clears throat> and the, the current sway or strong leaning of the administration and the left side of politics seems to follow this woke or near woke thing. And the irony is unbelievable not just Hamas, but the Arab nations uh, across the Middle East do not think of women as equal citizens. They have to. They don't know which way to look or or, or what to say. They, in crisis, I think is right. They they don't know what to do at this point. Yeah, I think there's what I would love to see the United States do <clears throat> is to to do what um, we tried to. As I mentioned to you before, I was one of two pastors I think that was involved in the sort of the final round round before the voting for the uh, Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action uh, under the Obama administration. And the reality there was is that uh, most of us that were working to try to stop that whole Iran deal, as it's been called, um, knew that all the Iran deal did was essentially give Iran a clear path to the bomb. It just delayed it. Um, but we also recognize that we had Iran in a very difficult economic situation. <clears throat> we literally had them in a straitjacket. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so it was, um, you know, we talked a lot about snapback in, in those days. It's like, okay, well, if we do this Iran deal, what's the snapback? What can we do, what can we do to get back to where we can restrict this? Uh, because as you, you kind of move through the different administrations, by the time you get to the Trump administration, for example, um, you know, he, he, he cut the deal, but not just, you know, any kind of money or payment that might go to them. But there was also other things, you know, re- relative to whether, how you could trade or what countries you could trade with, you know, um, it, it, it cut off, um, you know, any, a number of economic opportunities that Iran or Iran's government might be able to take advantage of. And the other thing is, is of course, oil production. And and if you, if you ramp up oil production in the United States um, and, and become an energy independent, which we were briefly, um, then what that does is that uh, diminishes the value of of any oil that they can produce or export. So I mean, there, there are things that we can do to put a tremendous amount of pressure on Iran, but um, we're not doing it. And likewise, uh, in the Middle East, uh, relative to, say, what some people would re- refer to as Palestine um, or, the, or the Palestinian people, the um, uh, funding that we have put in from the U.S. government into organizations like 
UNRWA, which is the UN uh, Works and Relief Agency that was created, oh gosh, well, maybe 70 years ago, to provide funding for the, uh, for the Palestinians, uh, what we would call Palestinians, um, in some of these territories um, in, in Israel. And, and unfortunately, what that's become is it's become essentially a revenue source that uh, provides payments to uh, families of terrorists, and there was a Taylor Force Act that we were we tried to in Washington to uh, those of us who are activists for Israel um, tried to uh, well we supported it we got it through but that was an intent to try to say can we stop giving money that we know is being filtered through these organizations getting into the hands of terrorists as a sport that's essentially aiding and abetting this sort of anti-Israel um, uh, effort. In other words, there's no. There's no real, uh, in all of this, there's there's nothing that we were doing that's really going to lead to any kind of peace or resolution. All we were doing is 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 uh, reinforcing uh, the Palestinians and organizations like Hamas in their effort to say, we want Israel, you know, from the river to the sea, gone. So, yeah, I, I guess for uh, the layman layman's understanding of what a Palestinian is. Could you describe why someone identifies as a Palestinian despite the fact that there is no Palestinian state? Well, exactly. I mean, if you say, you know, what what is, where, you know, where's Palestine? Okay, first of all, well, let's just go back and take a quick look at from the history. We know that the word Palestine or Palestina comes from, um, from the, it was really, I don't want to say the second Jewish revolt, but it was, uh, most of us are familiar with the, with the uh, uh, Jewish revolt in 70 AD, which saw the destruction of the temple uh, in Jerusalem. And um, from there, we know that many, many uh, Jews were killed within the borders of Israel and others fled um, to other, to other uh, parts of the ancient world. But it was 135 AD um, and when we have a different emperor. Um, we have uh, Hadrian, who is in the Middle East in the in the in this uh, the province, which was referred to at that time as the Judean province, uh, which is really more uh, accurate in terms of you know it, historically what that land was. It was the land of the Jews. That's where we get the word Jew from, Judah. But the um, so uh, it was Hadrian that put down the what was called the Barkova revolt, and uh, he was pretty much done with the Jews. He was he really wanted to uh, eliminate the Jewish people completely, and so. Uh, he wanted to destroy anything that was Jewish. I mean, he he, he banned the, the practice of, of of you know Hebrew worship, and uh, he expelled um, uh, many from the country. Um, of course, many many were killed as well. Uh, he renames uh, uh, Judea, um, Palestina, or actually Syria, Syria, Palestinia, uh, which is a uh, really borrowing from two of Israel's ancient enemies, the, the the Syrians and the and the Philistines. And he renames Jerusalem Aona Capitolina. So it's a uh, he he uh, he's trying to erase the Jews, and uh, and this is where I think we see I don't want to say the beginning of what's been called the diaspora or the dispersion of the Jews throughout the ancient world, um, but it actually was I think because um, we saw some of that in 70 A.D. and through the successive decades. But I think we really see it after 135. We see, you know, we could say, yeah, at that point there was there was uh, Jews that were that were leaving, uh, leaving Judea, and so uh, when we talk about Palestine, uh, that's where we get the name. Now, what's really interesting about it is that region became known as Palestine. Uh, pretty much, if you go from, you know, Hadrian, we're in the we're in the Roman period. So if you go. Uh, forward, you know, we understand that Rome eventually falls and sort of becomes. We see a continuation of Rome in the in the in the Byzantine area, Byzantium, uh, in the area of Constantinople now. So we know that the that the Byzantine Empire continues on. So you have a kind of uh, Rome Part Two uh, that continues on for quite a while, um, and that area is still referred to as Palestine. And then, of course. You know, successively there are, there are different people that will try to come in and dominate that area, and, and and the terminology that's referred to that area remains Palestine, going all the way back to Hadrian. But I think what's really um, interesting is is that um, uh, the the Palestine Palestine 
you know, the, the, the name was changed, but it, but the connection of the Jewish people was still with that land. In other words, it's even in the diaspora, there's a couple things we have to understand. One, that there were people who had lived in the land. Uh, I, I, I got to meet families who had, who had uh, ancestry generations back in the Galilee that had been there and mm-hmm. had never left. You know, um, there are other families in places like Hebron where, you know, you, you see generation after generation after generation. There are the point I want to make is, is that you have Jews that were, you know, can trace their lineage all the way back to, you know, uh, the, the uh, first and second centuries. Um, so you had Jews that have been in the land throughout all of these different sort of occupations. It's interesting. We talk about the occupation of Israel in that land. Actually, the land has been occupied by other forces, other people groups, um, pretty much since Hadrian forward. So the point there is, is that uh, you have people that you know can trace their lineage all the way back uh, to that first and second uh, century. <clears throat> And then we also know that they, we have a lot of um, archaeology that bears out the fact that this was a Jewish land. In other words, we can validate what we read in Scripture and what we, uh, what we know from history. We can read from other historical writings like Josephus and others that this was the Judea. This was the land of the Jews. Then the, point, the bigger point I want to make here, and that is the fact that when you talk about uh, I'm, I'm a Palestinian, if you had asked who were the Palestinians um, pretty much until I would say um, the 1950s, late 50s, early 60s, that term Palestine, Palestinian would have would would have been generally understood in Arab communities and in in pretty much any other communities, European communities, as being the Jews. Hmm. <laughs> it would have been the Jews. Wow. So, in wow. other words, and you can even see uh, when the Zionist movement, when we see the Zionist movement uh, with, through Theodore Herzl. You can even see posters and other things where it says we're going to go back and we're going to rebuild our land in Palestine, and it's Palestine, and and, and it's really interesting. Uh, you know, after the fall of the Ottoman Empire, I mean, there were Arabs that actually um, uh, recognized that the Jews were this was their ancient homeland, and and actually uh, welcomed the Jews back uh, who came back to to build their cities. Like I said, there were some that were always there, but there was an effort in the in the uh, Zionist movement. Um, which we saw uh, really in the late 1800s has really got started in the ni- early 1900s. You, you really get, you really see the people, the Jewish people, returning and wanting to and wanting to build and, and rebuild their cities and reestablish their their nation. And of course, there's a there's a journey from that point um, that took us through some dark days of um, World War One, World War Two, to get us to where we are today. But there's a lot of history there, and we could take a lot of time to unpack. But the bottom line is, is that yeah, I, I have a I have a picture that I sometimes show when I'm speaking about this of uh, Palestinians. I said I have a picture I want to show you of Palestinians, and so I'll show this picture that was taken in the early 1900s, and you see this these people standing in in Tel Aviv, and they're all Jews. Hmm. So what changed in the 60s, uh, where the term Palestinian meant Jewish, and now it means something different? for the last 60 years or so? Um, we see this really with the development of the Palestine, Palestinian Liberation Organization, mm-hmm. which it actually was aided and, embedded by, aided and abetted by the Russians in its development, I mean, in, in, in its inception. Um, and it was, uh, I'm not exactly sure what the objective was that for uh, Russian to get, Russia to get involved so much as they did uh, with people like Yasser Arafat. But um, you, see, you see a movement in the, uh, in the region and because it was not just in, uh, uh, it was in Israel, but it was not just in Israel. I mean, you you had quote Palestinians now uh, being referred to as, uh, you know, this or these uh, Arab communities that maybe didn't have a, a nation, a national identity, um, that were um, uh, causing problems in Israel. But they were also causing problems in Jordan and some of the other areas. That's part of the reason why some of these other countries don't want them in. I mean, if you really look at who the Palestinian people are today that we refer to as Palestinian, they're Egyptian or they're they are they're Jordanian. Um, they're they're Arab, but they are uh, they you know their their original affiliation. If, you know, if you go back a little bit, was 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 uh, probably not. Uh, th- in other words, there's no there was no nation state of Palestine. That was their nation state that they can reclaim, but um, no, I it, it's it's um, 
it's become very profitable. I will say that. I mean, I, I think if you if you look at what we see now in the territories and what we've seen in Gaza, for example, it's it's sort of a thugocracy. Um, you have uh, almost like warlords. You know, if you think of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, you think of Hamas, you think of some of these other organizations, uh, Hezbollah and others. Uh, it's it, it's it's a it's a kind of uh, 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 corrupt system, if you will, and and the people are totally victimized by it. I mean, it's really it's not a great it's not a great environment to to live in. I, and I need to add this: I don't think people realize that that uh, even in in Israel, that um, you know, a lot of these territories like Gaza, um, these Gaza and Jericho and Bethlehem and Hebron and uh, parts of the uh, of what we would call the West Bank are all under uh, Palestinian rule. They're under self-rule. So you have general oversight from the Israelis because they're going to they're going to look after their own security. But in these territories, they have their own rule. But unfortunately, that rule is very corrupt. And and the world has sort of paid into this, as I mentioned earlier, with UNRWA and other monies that have gone in. I don't think there's any other people group in the world that have been have had so much money poured into their into their hands. And and uh, unfortunately, it's it's uh, it's led to incredible corruption and and unfortunately victimization of of the people but the palestinians are um this identity what's really interesting is is they've gotten wrapped up in this identity now they 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 think this this was their ancient land and they are the, they are the ancient occupants so the history they're trying to rewrite history but it but the, uh, they they don't you know they they don't have it 60 years ago is not that long ago no. I mean, that's that's when it got uh, twisted by the russians and i'd forgotten the, the russians involvement with the PLO back then, uh, or their help forming that. Uh, so do Palestinians live in Egypt today or in Jordan or in Lebanon? Or, or the, are they, when we, when we say Palestinian, do we mean Gaza and the West Bank? Uh, I think, I think, hmm, I, you know, there are there, we know that we have Palestinian people, people who identify as a Palestinian who would be from places like Gaza or Hebron or the West Bank. We know that we have people who have, have, have adopted this identity as a Palestinian who live in the United States, mm-hmm. you know, um, who live in Europe, uh, who um, some of which may live in Jordan and, and in Egypt. But in, in the, the interesting thing is, is that these other countries, and I think this is actually what helped us with the Abraham Accords as well, is that these other countries... Um, you know, for example, if, if we know that a lot of the uh, what we refer to today as Palestinians, and at one point were in in Jordan um, or in Egypt, these countries really don't want them back. Not in certainly not in mass. Doesn't mean that you wouldn't have a Palestinian identity identifying a person identifying as a Palestinian living in Egypt or Jordan. It just means right. that you look now today, and and these other countries are like, oh, well, we really just keep them where they are. We don't really want them in here because. Uh, we know that that brings with them uh, these organizations like Hamas and Hezbollah, and we've seen what they've done to other countries. I mean, look what Hezbollah has done to Lebanon. They've just really, just really destroyed Lebanon, a wonderful country. Um, they've just they've really uh, caused a lot of heartache there. So, if if you're uh, identifying as Palestinian and you live in America or Europe, are you really telling the world that you're anti-Israel or anti-Jew? Well, I fundamentally think it's anti it's anti Semitic. I think it's, it's yeah. fundamentally they don't want the Jews. I yeah. mean, there 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 is there is no interest in in land for peace, and I think that was the biggest uh, bubble that was probably burst amongst those people that would be a little more liberal minded, and uh, in fact, even plays into some of what you see in our administration today and our State Department. The idea is that oh, we can come up with a deal, we can make a deal, we can make a deal. And there have been so many deals that have been offered over the years, really, uh, to try to bring uh, some kind of resolution to the to the uh, Palestinian-Israeli um, situation. And uh, they've been turned down, turned down, turned down, turned down. Because the, the ultimate goal is the elimination of the Jewish people. They just don't want them. And, 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 and I would say, I think what we've seen in recent weeks is it's not so much that they— they don't want them, you know, from the river to the sea to drive them out of the land of Israel. But you, you, you get the sense from the demonstrations, they don't want to see the Jewish people anywhere. I mean, the, the Jewish people are being um, 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 harassed, uh, attacked uh, around the world now. And, uh, 
and we're seeing uh, we're seeing this pro-Palestinian, even pro-Hamas um, rallies, support, protests, or what ha- what have you, uh, and it, and it um, it seems to me to be just overtly anti-Semitic. So I think it's really more let's get rid of the Jewish people. It seems evil. Getting rid of the Jewish people is murder. It's genocide, right? That's that's what they're going for. It, it just seems plain evil. Well, it's not. See, I, it's it's the same thing we saw in the Third Reich. It's the it's the same ideology that was adopted by by the Nazis. It was this fanatical desire to eliminate the Jewish people. I think I shared with you before. What's really amazing is is that to the extent that they went to try to find, categorize, and 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 then ultimately send um, people out to kill the Jews. I mean, they sent out you know uh, details that would. You know, if they if there was two hundred Jews on an island in the in the in the uh, Mediterranean, it's like mm, no, we can't let them go. So we're going to get them all. Let's just get them all. You know, that was the final that was the final solution. And uh, we we you would think that we would have learned our lessons from from all of that because when all that came forward. But uh, unfortunately, uh, we live in an era where we see a lot of Holocaust denial. Um, so a lot of this history is forgotten and uh, for, forgotten or twisted. It's really both. Yeah, it's minimized, and and I think it's so egregious when you know uh, people now will demonstrate and they will say it's the it's the it's the Jews that are the Nazis. It's the Jews that are perpetrating genocide. It's the Jews that are perpetrating um, a Holocaust. And here's the thing: if they if that's really true, the Jews could solve Gaza really easily. Very they, easily, they could just drop a tactical nuke and they're done. You know, yep. just wait a little while for the radiation to subside and go in and do what they want. There is no uh, no intention from the Jewish people to intentionally or deliberately harm or or take from the uh, uh, their uh, Arab neighbors. In other words, they've they've never been an an aggressor to try to to try to take. Um, they've always fought defensive defensively, and so. Um, so if they wanted to perpetrate genocide, they could do it. They, Israel, what we what we do understand and appreciate the fact is is that Israel really is, um, you know, a military superpower in that region. Well, they have to be. They have to come from a that, position of strength yeah. to survive. Exactly. Uh, you you had mentioned uh, the thugocracy, uh, and we'll we'll focus on Hamas. And there's been lots of money funneling to them uh, in theory. Some of that money was was well intended, but just naively uh, given to them, and they've done things that uh, it, it's hard to fathom. Do you have a sense of uh, the tunnels in Gaza, and and what sort yeah, of resources it, it took to it, to do that? It's it's really amazing. The tunnels. Of, I've had a chance to be in some of the tunnels in some of the military training bases in Israel, um, and I won't say where they are, but uh, but I've been in some of these uh, terror tunnels, so to speak, so uh, where the Israelis have trained to fight in there, uh, which is uh, <laughs> incredibly difficult to do. I can only imagine. Um, so, um, but uh, it's amazing that the tunnel systems that I've been in, that are the training tunnels. Um, that are built to sort of emulate the kind of tunnels that the uh, that Hamas and and uh, groups like Hezbollah have used. Um, they, they're small in comparison. I mean, they're they're tunnel networks, and the best way I could maybe describe it is, you know, think of the subways in New York or or the metro under Washington D.C. or whatever. Some of these tunnel systems, as you get into the larger systems, uh, are very large. You, you you know you can you can um, you can uh, uh, bivouac troops in there you can build weaponry in there you can uh, store ammunition you can shuttle troops from one place to the next so uh, the tunnel systems i mean if when you look at gaza if you look at it sort of almost uh, multi-leveled is what you can see on top and then there's you know um, underneath there's levels of of, of tunnel systems that are quite extensive. And uh, this is what has always been the challenge with Gaza. Uh, it was the fact that they knew that there was a lot of underground that they had to contend with. You can hit some of this from the air, but, you know, can you get deep enough? You know, maybe with bunker buster bombs or whatever, can you get deep enough to get into those systems? And then exactly where are they? I mean, that's the other thing. You can, you, you can try to gather intelligence about where they are, but this is what's happening now. Um, they're going through now, and I believe that the IDF is going to is going to try to uncover every inch of tunnel, uh, because of what I'm hearing from you know people like 
who I can talk with or on um, during the week. You know, it's a uh, yeah. They don't want to leave any. Of the, they don't. Want, they don't want to leave any. Not one shred of infrastructure left. So it's going to be interesting to see what they're doing. And and, um, and as you I sort of you and I chatted offline. You know, a lot of this, uh, a lot of these tunnel networks. Uh, you know, they're sort of the major hub is underneath that hospital in, in Gaza. So you know, that's intentional. That's to keep it from you know being uh, taken out. With uh, I mean, how are you going to take it out unless you actually go in there? Uh, without uh, firing uh, the, the kind of weaponry that would bring the hospital down. So, uh, but the Israelis are resolved; they're going to do it. But I was going to, just wanted to mention this: the tunnel systems. It's amazing uh, because the tunnels to get in across the border was a big objective, and and they seem to have pulled back from that some. And part of it because there were as extensive tunnel networks we know out of Gaza, but uh, that that were getting detected by the Israelis, and they were shutting them down. As some of those fingers of those tunnels would get close to the border fence, or 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 try to get under the border fence. But uh, there were some massive tunnels in the north, which is really you don't hear much about. But there were some incredible tunnels that were exposed in. Uh, uh, in, in Lebanon coming across the border and they were found and, and shut down. Some of these things just ran for miles. So, uh, it's hard to fathom. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it really is. It's, uh, it, it, it shows the determination to try to get at the, the to get at the, uh, uh, the Jewish state. And, um, but it also the money, I mean, this is the thing. I mean, just billions of dollars have been poured into, you know, uh, into, the Palestinian world, if you will, through organizations like UNRWA and uh, and and other other efforts, and we know that a lot of this money that was designed to try to improve the quality of life and try to you know they didn't they didn't build hospitals with them they didn't I mean I'm not saying they didn't spend maybe maybe some of that money got there but the point is is that you know uh, the government of these uh, territories is is that of Hamas um, or it's that of um, you know, formerly the PLO, or it's the Fatah Party, or it's whatever. You know, so you, you have uh, that's been the government for the people in these areas, and and revenue that they've received from the world is kind of a graft, you know, to to keep the peace, um, which they don't. Um, has been used uh, not to benefit the people so much, but to uh, to build infrastructure to attack Israel. And I think it's been said in recent days, and I was when I was at the the, the uh, meetings in Washington uh, with the rally, but I was also in a reception with the ambassador to the UN, uh, the Israeli ambassador to the UN and other members of Congress. And uh, we were meeting and it was, um, you know, this, the idea is if we could break the hold of Hamas over the people, um, there is the potential for a better, a better environment for the Palestinian people. Um, a better governance for them, a better um, a better life for them, um, because because right now we know, um, you know, they're they're Hamas is using not only they're using their people as a human shield, but they're shooting anybody that runs. In other words, is you're going to be here and you're going to be our human shield, or you know you're not going to leave. You're not going to. I think some have managed to get out, but uh, you know this is something that Hamas is using the people, um, and they have used and abused them for quite a while. Yeah, the, I mean, the the, the clearest uh, way to understand that there's been this massive con by Hamas is there are billionaires that are part of Hamas. I, I, the only way that happens is illegal funneling or illegal use of, of money uh, from what it was originally intended for. I have seen houses. This is amazing. I, as earlier this year, I was traveling through um, near Shiloh in Samaria, uh, not that far from Jerusalem. And, uh, my, my, my host, uh, wanted to show me some communities and there were these amazing mansions. I mean, just incredible mansions, incredible stonework, marble. I mean, just absolutely beautiful, beautiful homes. I mean, just, it's incredible. Nobody living in them, but they're owned by <clears throat> these thugs. You know, it's it's like they they have all this money and they're not spending it on the people so much. I guess maybe they get money from working on these houses, but they they have these like little palaces that they've got throughout scattered throughout the region. And you just kind of go, how is this even possible? Who are these people? And and you know, 
you know, the money that's coming in, you know, they don't have an economy per se. They're not like, you know, and that's the shame because I think if they could work together with Israel, like we've seen in the Abraham Accords, and this is what Israel has said. Israel has said, if you will work with us, if you'll put down your guns, if you'll work with us and partner with us, we can, we can develop economic partnerships. So Gaza could be a, a great uh, tech center or, 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 or there could be, you know, other things that can drive your economy other than graft and corruption and, and, and the, and the whole, you know, military apparatus, you know, of murder. I mean, it's, 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 uh, I mean it, but it's, uh, unfortunately what you have to get past is, you know, Hamas and, and these organizations that, you know, their, their people are, these are not good, good guys. <laughs> you know, they're not good guys at all. Cause it sounds like there's enough resources <clears throat> where they could have a, an economy that where Palestinians could thrive. The average Palestinian could thrive if they if they were being led by a different set of folks. Exactly, and and a lot of Palestinians have, and this is the this is the I think the the tragedy, and this is something that's just come up in recent days. Um, I don't. Right now, there's a great deal of tension, as you can imagine, in Israel. Um, but the tension now, and this is really heartbreaking. There's a lot of tension between the Arab and the. Um, Jewish community. Now, you say, no, wait a minute, what are the Palestinians? Okay, we got to delineate a little bit because you have the, you have Arab Israelis. So these are, these are Arabs um, by, I don't want to say race, but, but they're Arabs by um, ethnicity. Ethnicity. Thank you. That's the word I'm looking for. Yeah. Um, and you have, they, and they're living in Israel as Israeli citizens and, and they have representatives in the Knesset and they, you know, they can vote and they can participate in Israel as any Jew could. They're Israelis. Uh, they're, they're Israelis. Yeah. And so now there's a lot of tension between them. Uh, and, and I've talked to Arab Israelis that would rather live in Israel than anywhere, any Arab country in, in the Middle East. They said, yeah, that's pretty good. We, we like it here. So we're, we want to stay here. And there's some that there's some that don't. There's some that you know there's that don't like the uh, the government or the or the, that they you know and they they tend to be um, a little anti-Israel. But the the point right now is there's a great deal of tension because while you haven't necessarily seen an uprising in these Arab Israeli communities, um, there is fear, and the fear now is it's both ways. The Arab community is afraid of what the Jews are going to do because they know the Jews are out to route out any, you know, anti-Zionist, any anti-Jewish, any anti-Israel issue, any, you know, sentiments. Um, so, so they're withdrawn. In fact, um, I, I learned yesterday that it was weeks where you have a lot of, a lot of Arabs, uh, Israelis work in uh, pharmaceuticals and that kind of thing, and they work in a lot of drug stores, and and uh, you see them in shops and other places, and grocery stores and things. And and for the first three or four weeks of the conflict, they, they just didn't come to work because hmm. they were afraid of what the Jews were going to do. Yeah. So to them, um, and then uh, the Jews are afraid of the Arabs. Because it's like, well, okay, these are my neighbors, and I've, you know, I've been on the, on the uh, uh, light rail with them. I've been in shops with them. I see them in the drugstore. Drug you know, we we integrate. They're in the restaurants with me or whatever. But now it's like this fear each group has of each other because they don't know what might happen. So, um, so this is this is unfortunate because I think there there's going to be um, ongoing tension. Um, I don't know if there's a quick resolution to that. Um, the Israelis are obviously very united right now. The Arabs and the, in the in, in Jewish uh, communities are, you know, they're, I don't see they're hunkered down. They're, they've been hunkered down. They're starting to come out a little bit more. But there is this concern. Um, you know, where, where does all of this go? And <clears throat> that's different. I want to say the Arab, the Arab Israeli versus the Palestinian. The Palestinian has basically said, I'm, I'm checking out of Israel. I'm going to be in one of these land for peace settlement areas like Hebron or uh, or Gaza and I'm going to uh, identify as a Palestinian and and be under Palestinian authority uh, whether that's Fatah whether that's Hamas or whatever it is but what I wanted to say is in terms of economic development still the Palestinians that identify as Palestinians who live in places like Bethlehem or other other places they have been coming in to work in Israel and finding 
work. In other words, there there is a economic incentive for them to come in and and work. And and then sadly, many of them were coming in. Uh, I mean, tens of thousands were coming out of Gaza to work in areas and a lot of these communities that ended up being uh, destroyed. And so, uh, and, and the Jews were in those communities were welcoming them and felt like this was helping to build relationship and that, and that was broken, but that's, that's what Hamas wanted to do. Hamas wants to, to uh, discourage and break any, any kind of effort toward any kind of normalization of relationship, you know, any kind of cooperation with the, uh, with the uh, Jewish state. Mm. I, I want to go back to this notion of uh, not understanding history or twisting history. We, we've seen a lot of protests uh, across Europe and in America, uh, in our bigger cities, so San Fran, New York, etc. I wonder if you and I went to these protests, and once the protests had sort of broken up, and you and I had a chance to interview a hundred folks that are protesting Israel's actions for the last uh, several weeks. I wonder how many of them have zero understanding of Israel's history or that region's history and the history of World War II and the Third Reich. I wonder how many of them have virtually no clue any of that history. What percentage do you think that would be? I, I, don't, would be a chance to interview I, I don't know. I mean, I think it would be very, very few. I mean, we see this sometimes when people, you know, brave into these groups with, a, you know, kind of, and, and you know, pull someone aside and do a kind of man in the street interview. And and you and you hear what they're saying and you're like, you, do you really understand what, what um, you know, you're calling, you're calling uh, Israel Nazis. Do you really know what a Nazi was? They, they don't. Do you really There's understand? No, way they do. There's no, no do you really understand what fascism is? Do you really understand uh, really what socialism is or communism? Do you really understand, have a fundamental understanding of that? Do you have an understanding of history? Um, and unfortunately, you don't. So much is, so much is emotion. So much is, uh, um, that we're given over to is emotion. And, uh, but, uh, but unfortunately, the, the concern I have, generally speaking, and this goes even wider than the conflict that we're seeing now, but I mean, generally speaking, uh, uh, in the... You know, when I see these kinds of protests uh, on the college campuses and that kind of thing, um, the thing that concerns me is, and, and let me let me just backtrack and tell a little bit of a story. I remember, this goes all the way back to LBJ, Lyndon Baines Johnson. And Lyndon Baines Johnson was a consummate back door, I mean back, back room, sorry, back room politician. Yep. That's how he made his deals. So I'm going to meet with you, and I'm going to try to tell you I'm going to do this with you, and then I'm going to go to somebody else. I'm going to tell them that, and so uh, so the the his his aides said that television was his undoing, mm. and the reason it was is because. If he said something you know, that was recorded on television one day, and then a month later, he said something that was counter to that, even though that might have been how he politicked in the back room, now it's out front, and people see that he is misleading, that he may be outright lying about lacks, certain things. Lacks integrity. Can't trust him. And so the issue then became, um, you know, how do we deal with that? Because, you know, you can't, you know, this is being recorded. But here's here's the bigger point. Truth mattered in that era. Truth mm-hmm. mattered. F- integrity, facts, truth mattered. Now flash forward. Come all the way up to the time of the Clinton administration because you 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 heard then another term that uh, was sort of an excuse for when we uh, are less than honest in front of the cameras. And we said, that's just political rhetoric. In other words, you need to understand that I have to say whatever I want to say or have to say in order to advance my agenda. And that's just rhetoric. So if I'm lying to you, you just have to accept I'm lying to you if it, if it, achieves, if it achieves my objective. It, but before the Clinton administration, that had not been a thing. No. Yeah. So now truth, truth has shifted from where American society, by and large, would say, wait a minute, I don't care who you are. I don't care what jersey you're wearing, Republican or Democrat. You can't come out there and lie to me. Okay, That matters. We, we don't like that. Then we've gone to like, well, we can accept lies, because yeah, it's part of advancing our objectives. So, you know, we can tolerate it. But where I think we've gone today is we've now go forward a, a few more years and we've reached the point where truth is relative. 
it's it's not it's not even it's beyond political it's beyond political um, expediency. It's just relative. It's just and and, and the best way I could uh, describe it is I remember when uh, uh, Ron Dermer, uh, who I really love that guy, and uh, he's been a he's just a tremendous ambassador for Israel. Uh, really, really bright guy, a great uh, spokesperson for Israel. And uh, I worked it out so he could speak to a convocation at Liberty University um, a few years back. And he basically talked about this sort of moral relativism that we're seeing. And he says, when you can't tell the difference between the firefighter and the arsonist, we have a problem. And this is where we are today. In other words, you know, to the groups that are protesting, they can't tell the firefighter from the arsonist. Yeah. They would just as readily attack the firefighter as they would the arsonist. They're they're making the victim the aggressor. They are flipping the script, as as we would say on this thing. Now the question is, could you reason with them with facts, with information? I don't know because so much of what they uh, they 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 think they understand is probably false facts. Um, but the other is, is they're 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 running on emotions. They're running on emotions, and they're manipulated by emotions. And I and I and I think we've become a culture that is less grounded in fact and and more and more uh, affected or influenced by emotion and that's a dangerous place to be you know it's a kind of mob mentality my late mother used to say that uh, in the united states what we've become is an uneducated rabble mm. uh, in that situation it unfortunately makes us rife for um political manip manipulation and uh, it's it's a dangerous it's a dangerous place to be yeah, that that was a beautiful answer, uh, Mark. Uh, I yeah, I I think it happens. Well, I think there are forces uh, that are trying to manipulate people that are ignorant, uh, and they can do it by playing on on the grayscale that you just described. When I was a kid, I, everything was black and white. Journalism was a serious thing. Right. They were trying to find the truth. They were trying to present facts, uh, and that's just simply not true. It's. It, it is so bizarre to me how, because the word journalism is not even used anymore. It's just, things are going out. There, there are commentaries, there are editorials that are just politically motivated, it seems. It seems like everything is political. Well, I, 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 this is also a lament to me to somebody who had a media background, somebody who worked in the news, news business uh, for, for, uh, for a bit, and somebody who was trained you know, when I went to college in, in journalism or journalism, took journalism or understood journalistic practice at the time. And now I'm going back into the 70s and early 80s. But, you know, it was generally understood there are always biases. I mean, if you take any individual uh, in any story, you know, you there, there are always it's hard to bury a bias. Um, but th the point of journalism was you were you were to try to be objective and try to present both sides of an argument. And your role was understood as not to be um, so much an influencer than an informer. Um, and that anything else becomes what we called in that day advocacy media. Uh, and that's where we are now with everything. Uh, there is no... Well, here's, you know, here are the facts. You know, I don't think there's anybody that's really outside of uh, a, a, a few agencies that are that are that are <laughs> trying to go upstream right now uh, with the whole situation in uh, in uh, in Israel, you know, trying to say uh, here's here are the real facts here. Here's you know what we've been talking about today. Here's the real history of Israel. Here's here's the history of the Palestinian conflict or whatever it is. Um, you know, they're going upstream because it's a, uh, uh, you know, there's just been so much. Uh, I don't know so much so much distortion, but it but but the but the there's no it's on it, right now it's just out it, it's just out and out almost propaganda against uh, against the state and and like I said facts facts don't don't matter. You say almost propaganda, I would call it propaganda. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Okay, we can. Yeah, I think that's fair. Uh, let's talk about the hospital. Uh, hospital's been in the news a lot lately. When I say hospital, what what do you think? Or, or what would you describe when I say the hospital? Well, I heard a little bit about this yesterday in the briefing that I was in, and uh, that came up. Um, and it was one of those we actually had, in addition to the uh, to the general that usually gives us a, a military update, that there was a journalist that was an Israeli journalist that was speaking to us. And he said there was really interesting is the world – as soon as that as that uh, missile strike in Gaza hit that uh, hospital, 
um, it went out on the world press that the Israelis had fired on a hospital. And uh, I mean, within moments, I mean, that was the, that was the news that went forward. And they said, of course, it took the Israelis um, a couple hours to try to determine, well, exactly what happened. And, and, and you being in the military could probably imagine what that was like. Did anybody fire a missile? Did we fire a rocket? Did right. anybody, you know, and do we have any intelligence on this? Do we have any video on this or whatever it is? And, of course, they did. And uh, a couple things they found out. First of all, uh, the rocket was fired from a parking lot, and it basically came back down and hit a parking lot, so it never hit the hospital at all. Uh, the claim of 500 people being killed was a false claim because if it hit in the parking lot, it could not have killed 500 people in the building. So that was a, that was a, a, a false statement that unfortunately was was uh, you know carried throughout the uh, world press. And then the um, 60 years ago, that would have been verified. Yeah, before they released exactly. It. And so right, there's no verification now. It's just we're going to go on that. And then the other was is that. Uh, no, the Israelis had video. I saw the video. Uh, you, you see the rocket launch. You see it go up and it come right back down. I'm sure the, the guys that launched it went, oops, like, oh, my gosh, you know, my thing is coming back on us, you know. And um, But this is it. I think people don't realize that 25% of the, 20 to 25%, I guess, of the rockets fired, that have been fired over the years, uh, fall inside of Gaza. So so they, they cause dis- destruction, but that's okay. That's okay because if it does, it just gives them another uh, a photo op. They, you know, if, if something blows up, it's Israel's fault. And actually, in their ideology, they they think that any anything that they do or anything that happens is Israel's fault. Because even if I fire the missile and it misfires or it comes back, well, that's Israel's fault. Because if Israel wasn't, you know, Israel, we wouldn't be firing this rocket. We wouldn't be here. Right. So it's it's Israel's fault no matter what. But they're playing the victim. It's it's a it's a group of it's an organization playing. It works really well for them. It gets them a lot of money, actually. You know, to the people that are that are you know on the in the leadership side of it that are that are pushing this. So we've discovered that that hospital, the, the hospital that's been talked about in the the press recently, is really a command center. Underneath, underneath yeah. it is. It's yeah. I think it's if it's not the hub, it's one of a it's a major hub. Because the uh, Hamas is going to build this in places where you know the Israelis wouldn't wouldn't dare strike for you know because of what we're talking about now the world would would somehow condemn them for it. What we've talked about in the last fifty two minutes, I, I don't think there's any other part of the world that has a history anything like what we're talking about. In terms of in terms of conflict, I mean, we would just in terms of of, of the bizarre nature of of the conflict. I. I mean, all conflicts are, are bizarre in their own right, but uh, this particular, the history of that region, Israel, mm-hmm. and then expanded maybe 100 miles in every direction. It, I can't think of any part of history that has experienced that. Well, no, and it's interesting. I have my brother. Uh, my brother and I, I haven't done this in a while. I need to call him. <laughs> <laughs> but we uh, we used to get together when uh, he and I both worked in the West End, and you know we'd go over to Melita's and we'd have lunch, uh, well, usually about once every couple of weeks. I remember one time he asked me, he said, what is the deal with Jerusalem? You know, and he didn't mean it in a negative way. He's like, there's no oil, there's no gas, there's no gold, there's no what. It's like, why is everybody fighting over this place? And and it goes back to, you know, from a larger sense, you know, all of this, you know, Israel and the Jewish state. It just goes back to the fact that, you know, um, there has been a effort to try to destroy the Jewish people from Abra- from the Abrahamic covenant forward. Yeah. You know, God said, you know, I'm going to create a special ethnic group. I'm going to create a special group of people that will be set apart, and I'm I'm going to it's going to be through them that I'm going to bring my word, bring my instruction, the Torah. I'm going to it's through these people that ultimately will will bring redemption and salvation for the world. And uh, and we see that with with Christ, the Messiah, and uh, even even Jesus Himself saying, "The salvation is of the Jews." So the point of it is, is that if you look out through history, I mean, this is amazing. I mean, it's been at least nineteen successive civilizations that have tried to eradicate the Jews, mm. and they still exist. Wow. Um, which has led commentators like uh, Mark Twain to say, "What is the secret of their existence and survival?" 
uh, and Billy Graham to say, you know, uh, if you want evidence that there is a God, look at the Jewish people because they shouldn't exist. But I think the conflict that we're seeing today is just a continuation of what we've seen through history. Um, this this incredible um, uh, anti-Israel, anti because uh, people have asked me in, in light of what's happened in the last few weeks, um, you know, where does all this hatred come from? Why are they? Why are the Jews been so under fire? Because it's not just in Israel they're under fire now; they're under fire everywhere. And uh, I think I said it goes back to uh, something a Jewish rabbi friend of mine that I shared before said to me. He said, "If you can get rid of the Jewish people and you can burn the Torah scrolls, you can make God any way you want." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, um, I, I I can't tell you how uh, amazing a conversation with you is because I'm. Almost everything you're saying, I, I can't get anywhere else as an American citizen. As, as a person who appreciates history, wants history to be told correctly, I, I'm saddened by the fact that I, I had to get lucky to uh, connect to you to hear what I'm hearing. It's, it's not getting out the way. I know that's been a big concern um, with Israel and with a lot of um, Christians who have been advocates for the Jewish state, um, people who are working uh, in journalism, working in media that are trying to get the real story out. I know right now there's a real effort. You know, we talked about the different layers of this war, and that's the, the war of public opinion. And so there's a lot of effort to try to get this kind of information out there. I mean, I'm not the only one, of course, but but the idea is, is that, you know, how do we get this information out? So I appreciate the opportunity to have this dialogue because this is what I'm trying to have is, you know, and this is what we're encouraging other people to say and stand. It's um, when it comes to Israel, I think the thing, and I think I shared this the last time I was here too. And that was the fact that in talking with some other pastors who um, understand the significance of Israel biblically, historically, understand what Israel means today, understands, you know, the dynamics of, of what's happening today. Um, you know, they will, they will say, or we will say when we get together, you know, um, you know, how do, how do we get this information? How do we get this information out there? And, 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 and the, the shocker actually in this is when we kind of talk and compare notes is how fundamental we have to go. I think sometimes we just assume people understand certain things. I mean, that could be said truthfully about, I mean, not just, you know, the Bible, it could be said about history. I mean, you know, we've talked about this today. I mean, the fact is, you you know, you sit there and say, okay, I'm going to try to frame an argument based on facts, based on history. But if you don't know that history, you know, how fundamental do I have to get, right. you know, yeah, yeah. how far back do I have to go? And with Israel, one of the, one of the things I was talking to one pastor in particular, who's a very great spokesman for Israel, better than me. And he basically said, um, he said, man, he's like, you know, I, I always feel like I have to bring to my audience some new perspective or some new, you know, I have to go deeper or I have to go broad, you know, not broader, but deeper into into the, in, into sort of my discussion and argument. But the truth is, it's like, no, I got to go fundamental. We're 101 because yeah. people just don't know. They don't understand Israel biblically. They don't understand the history. They don't understand what's happening. All they really know is they know from what they see on the news, which unfortunately is really biased and, and, and it's just it's just it's just right at the surface of of the of the history of the region it's not even um i mean people just really don't understand um what's happening there now what's interesting to me is in some of the churches there's a sense that wait a minute israel is important but they don't know they don't even know how to defend it and so you know opportunities like this and opportunities when i can speak in church churches is to try to say or have a dialogue with people, which I like to do this actually more than I like to stand up and speak is just to have a dialogue and people begin to understand it. Oh, I didn't think of it that way. <laughs> I'm a history major. I've been to the Middle East and uh, I'm learning a ton from uh, these two conversations I've had with you. <laughs> and so, so imagine the people that are not history majors, the people that don't really think about history as being important uh, to tell it accurately or, or people that have never been to the region or never even thought about the region how much they don't know. Exactly. No, that's right. They don't. And uh, unfortunately, it makes, unfortunately, dealing with critics a little bit difficult too uh, because, you know, the facts are distorted. The history is, is, is incorrect. And it's amazing some of the incredible things. I had an Israeli um, send to me. This is, this is just nuts, but I got to share it with you. Um, uh, I'll make, in fact, maybe we can share the clip with you if I can find it on my phone. But the, uh, 
uh, an Israeli friend of mine um, in Modain sent me a clip. It was a video that I think was posted on TikTok or something. It was a Palestinian woman, and they were making the claim that the UK, this imperialist nation, uh, which has been, in this woman's mind, part of the this plot against the Palestinian people, had stolen Big Ben from them, that they had come to Palestine, taken Big Ben brick by brick and built it in London. And, and, and you know, they have taken this from us, this, this national treasure. This, you know, we've, we've just been so put upon. And you just kind of go, wow. I mean, this is really getting crazy, what people are saying, what people are believing. And uh, it's unfortunate. You know, because I, you know, I guess if I had never been told anything else, if I had been raised, you know, and that's, and that is, by the way, going to be another issue that we're going to have. Uh, if Israel and Israel knows it, if they are, if they are victorious, which they will be in this conflict, the bigger problem they're going to have is they have so many people that have just been educated from kindergarten forward in a false narrative and a false history. They've been institutionalized into fiction. Yeah, exactly. That, that's hard to deal with. Yeah. Uh, and, and it passes down generation to generation as well. Yeah, it'll take a while. It'll be, there'll have to be some addressing of that because, I mean, we had the Hitler youth. We had to, we had to address that. You know, you, there, there, was, there was this, you know, um, and I'm sure, and by the way, I'm sure there probably was a whole generation of people that were not, you know, that didn't necessarily, you know, they weren't necessarily on trial at Nuremberg, but they might have been, you know, um, of lesser rank or, or lesser authority. But uh, the, the point is, is that there probably was a whole generation of people that felt like, you know, they were right. And uh, we see that. We see that actually st- uh, filtering in, and we saw it filter into uh, the Middle East today. I mean, those influences are, are still there. Yeah, your Big Ben story would be a fantastic story if it was understood to be fiction hmm? by all. But... <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, there, yeah, there, there exactly. are some that, that believe it's real. Exactly. Oh, uh, wow. Uh, I know you've got some things you've got to attend to. I love uh, these conversations. I appreciate it. No, I'm, I'm going to keep bringing you back. <laughs> I, I'm, 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 learning, I'm learning a ton. I'm learning a ton. So if you well, have the time, I certainly Sure, have yeah. Time. That's an evolving story because there are just different dimensions now. Because we are, we, when we first talked, we were, we were just getting into the, the war public opinion. But also, all of this is testing um, Israel's resolve, and other issues and things are coming out. So, yeah, it's it's, a, it's an evolving story, so I'm happy to talk about it. No, that's great. I appreciate you doing this again, and uh, I hope you have a great Friday and great uh, weekend. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. If you enjoy this episode, please subscribe to wherever you listen to podcasts. We'd also really appreciate if you'd rate and review us. You can find us at scodopodcast.com.